Welcome to Conversations on Climate. My name is Chris Caldwell and this series is produced by United Renewables in collaboration with the London Business School Alumni Energy Club. Today we're speaking to you from the global investment firm Invesco in Portman Square in London. Invesco are trusted to manage $1.3 trillion of assets. And Invesco trust our guests today to guide them through the increasingly complex world of ESG which is short for environmental, social and governance, a set of standards that measures a business's impact on society and the environment and has become a huge asset class in its own right. Catherine de Connick lopez spent nine years in socially responsible investing in Columbia Threadneedle and then became head of ESG for Europe at Invesco for two years before being appointed to her current role as global head of ESG. We undertook a deep exploration of the world of ESG and investment management, taking things from first principles and moving into more complex areas such as how a background in science informs decision making, the depth of the role of head of ESG, nature positive investments and the development of ESG investing beyond mere carbon, and is a passive ESG strategy even possible, and giving some advice for making sustainable investments for tomorrow. It was a great pleasure to be able to speak to one of the world's leading authorities on ESG. This is a conversation that you won't want to miss. Around 80% of people who listen to this podcast haven't hit the follow button. If I could ask you for a small favour, if you do enjoy our conversations, please do hit that follow button on your app. It would help us in the show more than I could possibly say. Thank you and enjoy the conversation. Catherine, thank you so much for taking the time to come and speak to us out of your extraordinarily busy schedule. Thank you for having me. Brilliant. Well, can we uh, just you know, go dive right in? Um, ESG is a subject that means a lot of things to a lot of people. And um, I know any explanation of what ESG is could take up the entire length of this podcast. But what does ESG mean to you? It's, people do tend to narrowly define it in terms of carbon, but it obviously means an awful lot more. So where, Absolutely. Where you, yeah. So there are, I think, two ways of describing it. One is in kind of the subject itself, so the E, S, and G, which is, as you say, under the E pillar, you would have carbon emissions, you'd have water emissions, you'd have topics like biodiversity. Then on the social pillar, you'll have issues like human rights, labor conditions, you know, even data privacy is increasingly coming into that social pillar. And then on governance, you have things like the structure of the boards, remuneration issues, audit concerns, etc. So that's, you know, at a very high level how you broadly define the topic areas. But then what has happened in the industry is that ESG has then also been defined in terms of investment approaches. And so you have a whole spectrum of investment approaches from what you call ESG investments process integration versus ESG product. And those two are different things. And then within that, you have then the functional areas as well, the ES and G. So the whole landscape becomes really complex as a result of these different issues. In each of those those aspects you're talking about, there's different subsets and subsets and subsets as you go down, like your your managed funds, your passive funds, and all of them with ESG banners, and and everybody trying to stick an ESG label on what they're trying to do, and yeah, Absolutely. the world does get extremely complex, which is why it's wonderful to to get the chance to, to speak to you about this all. Um, but before we get into into the weeds on that, could we talk a little bit about yourself? Sure. Yeah. So um, your background is in, you had two degrees in science before you, you, you came to this field. Um, and then you went kind of pretty much directly into investment management afterwards. Um, what kind of brought you to ESG before it was a theme, before it was cool? <laughs> I was always interested in linking sustainability and business. Mm -hmm. And so I studied sustainability because back when I started university around 20 years ago, there just, there wasn't the option to study the combined, you know, efforts, which there is now, which is fantastic. And so you now have these, this growing pool of, of candidates that are actually able to study these kind of interesting subjects together, but I wasn't able to do that. So I went the scientific route and always thought I'll do business later, which is which is what I did. I then did my, after my two science degrees, my executive MBA at London Business School. Um, and so I was brought into, you know, from the science field uh, into financial services 
from actually my master's thesis in particular, which was in climate science and um, the IFC doing an investment actually in Nepal, a hydropower plant. And so I was looking at, you know, sustainability of that kind of investment under different scenarios of climate change. That was my thesis. And so because of that, I got interested in, oh, the finance world actually has a really big role to play in these kind of sustainability themes and actually making you know, the world more sustainable. And so we had um, a guest lecturer come and talk at my master's and that person at the time, Columbia Thread Needle, had an had an opening, and so I went straight from my master's into into that, and it was it was all very, you know, opportunistic. It was the only job I applied to, and and wonderful. got it, and that was that was how I ended in finance. That's, that's wonderful, yeah, that's wonderful. And uh, so, what kind of skills from the world of science do you find is useful in your your current day to day in the investment house? Well, honestly, I use it every day, mm -hmm. and that is, you know, not everybody can say that about their jobs today, but. I do use my scientific background every day. Things like even this climate change modeling, you know, back then, as you said, wasn't modern. Now it's actually regulated. Uh, you know, something all financial services houses have to do. And, um, you know, having that, had that background and having that understanding, it's just, I think, absolutely essential to understand some of the pros and cons of some of the models we use, some of the challenges, some of the assumptions you have to make, and then, you know, some of the outcomes of that. And, and you know, being able to challenge that is, is really important. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you are one of only two scientists we've uh, we've interviewed so far it's uh, so it's you know it's fantastic to get your your take on it um kind of scientific method um in looking at problems is quite different to uh, methods that would come from from other realms of academia of like you know economics or game theory or, or anything like that um how do you how do you kind of balance off your 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 scientific training and your training from from the MBA how do they how do they kind of complement each other in your your own thought processes well ESJ is exactly how those two skill sets have to come together because actually the ESG role, regardless of your subject matter, if it's in the E, S or J, if you're a specialist in the E as I was, but then you link the business side, which is the product, the systems thinking, the stakeholder thinking, you know, that you, you, you get from the MBA, you link those two, really that those are the skill sets you need in an ESG role because you have to be a subject matter expert, but you have to understand as well the applications in a business context and, and you know the sensitivities and the challenges and and how you build business plans and so on and obviously in a global head of ESG role as I am now that is that is essential actually. Fantastic and which leads us very nicely to um, what is your day-to-day -day as head of you know as global head of head of ESG for you know enormous fund manager at uh, Invesco. Yeah, well, the day to day, luckily, is very varied. Uh, so I don't think I have, you know, a standard day. But I would say in terms of my team, and, and I get involved in all of the team activities, actually, at some level, obviously, there's the, the strategy setting and the interfacing internally with various stakeholders. But then we have four key areas we focus on. So clients, so working with clients, meeting clients, talking to clients about what their needs are on ESG is a really big part of my day to day. The second component is research and engagement. So we uh, engage at Invesco, not just in my team, but collectively with around 3,000 companies a year. And so we meet with a lot of companies, a lot of stakeholders, and talk about these issues with companies. And so I get involved in some of that as well. On the research side as well, we have our own research system, so ESG Intel. So again, I get involved with understanding that system, looking at new data sources, looking at new insights we can pull into that system and covers about 15,000 securities. And then also, we also have voting. So as a shareholder, an equity shareholder, you get a vote in an annual general meeting and you get a vote even in an active or a passive strategy. So at Invesco, actually, we vote in around 9,000 securities a year which is a lot of companies where you actually say, yes, I will approve this chairman, or yes, I will approve this audit and counts, or yes, I'll approve this climate change resolution. And um, so, you know, I oversee that process and we in the ESG team um, set the global proxy policy 
in partnership with our investment teams. And then the final component I spend my day to day on is data and analytics. So in the ESG world, you're constantly looking at new data sets, new ways of analyzing companies, because actually that's what you're doing in an ESG role. You're analyzing companies, but not just from its PNL or its cash flows or its um, you know balance sheet. You're analyzing using its stakeholder management, its environmental emissions, or the way it governs itself. And so to do that, you need new data sources. And so we have a whole pillar and actually right now have over 50 different data sources that we use for ESG. So my data today is very varied. It's very broad. And all, all of that is in a global context as well. So in you know Asia, uh, Europe, and, and the US. Wow, that's, uh, that's, that's mind blowing. Um, where do you start with all of that? Like, there's so there's so many so many areas, so many ways you could be digging into uh, into any of that. Um, I suppose just kind of first thing that comes to mind is kind of asking the when you're kind of advising companies and talking about the, the analytics. Um, how does your role differ with the role of of a kind of more kind of traditional kind of fund manager? Do you go in and talk? together with the fund manager or do you is it, and, and what happens if there's a conflict between you know fund manager saying yeah sure you should just chop down that forest to be great and you're going oh, wait stop <laughs> yeah. well that yeah. is a great question mm. and so the role of the ESG team is to advise to provide tools to provide insights to provide analytics and data but the fund manager makes the decision so the fund manager has you know the full fiduciary interest of the client at heart right and we in the ESG team provide that insight and tools and say, okay, but so in your example, if a company has an issue around forest management or sustainability of its supply chain, for example, we would highlight that and say this, these are the types of challenges that that may come uh, with from a financial perspective. So it could be, well, if you have a lack of a supply chain sustainability, can you actually still deliver your product to a client? Is your product gonna be more expensive? Is there a wider, you know, corporate sustainability issue as a result? And that's the kind of advice and dialogue we would have the, with the fund manager or analyst, but they would make the final decision on where they choose to actually invest or, you know, not. Okay. And is that the same with um, with kind of voting as well? So they make the they make the decision, but you advise. Precisely. Perfect. Okay, I understand. That's, that's, that's that that clears up a lot for me. So yeah, we we can dig into that a little bit later on. But okay, perfect. Thank you. So um, just kind of looking back a little bit, um, well, well, ESG and the whole ESG fund management space has exploded over, over recent years. Um, it's been, been a huge success story, but 2022 was really hard for across, across the board. Um, and 2023 isn't looking like it's going to be much better. But assuming that it is, we are going to recession and things, things are getting tighter. First question is, how do you see ESG performs in uh, difficult markets? And do you see a risk that companies, as they feel under more pressure, might just take this as, well, you know, marketing budget, cut that, oh, ESG, we can cut that, cut it a bit too. And, you know, or, or has ESG been kind of bought into the DNA of, of businesses over recent years? I think there is definitely a difference between a company's strategy and its responsibility to its, you know, its bottom line, but also its stakeholders and its employees and, and the environment in which it operates and how a company manages that through a recession, right? And then there is the fund industry and how a fund would would do and how in, you know the ESG construct in which it operates will that will be impacted by the rules that are being set. So those are I think two slightly different things. I think a company that is well managed, including looking at ESG issues, should do better in a recession because they are looking at these from a long-term perspective. They are likely to be lower volatile, right? They're likely to have had an eye to the future, to have had an eye to those kind of resilience questions. And so I think those kind of companies should do better from a broad, good quality management perspective. Now, in a fund construct, you are, you are subject to, to a very broad uh, range of options, right? And, and as, we, as we were alluding to earlier, there's kind of the process integration where you're really looking for you know, ESG issues, but you may choose to uh, buy a company that perhaps you know, have challenges, but if the price is, is low and it's, it's incorporated in the price, those challenges are incorporated in the price, and you think actually that company is working on those challenges and improving, Actually, that might be your best investment from a finance. If your client really only has financial return 
as its objective, right? Mm -hmm. Where you're then moving into other ESG options where you have screens, right? You're saying, actually, I'm, my clients don't want to invest in tobacco or they don't want to invest in thermal coal, for example. You are then bound by those kind of exclusions. And so even a tobacco company that is perhaps managing its, you know, its, its way forward in this, its kind of regulated world and developing new solutions, et cetera, you can't invest in them regardless, right? So, so in a fun construct, you are bound by those kind of restrictions. So that's great. Then you move into kind of more, I would say, um, stronger ESG focused options like responsible funds or sustainable funds or even impact funds. And there you are likely to see even, even tighter restrictions and controls. And they could be about carbon optimization. They could be about saying, I only want to invest in companies that score really highly on all ESG metrics. So really the best in class companies. And you move into, you know, different variations. And to your earlier point, there are thousands and thousands of different types of products out there and, you know, different constructs of those variations. And so performance and, the, and, and how you will do in those in the 2022 and the 2023 environment really depends on where you fall on that spectrum, mm -hmm. right? And where you are thinking about ESG and what matters to you as a, as a client. What I will say, just generally in a recessionary environment, the kind of the broad themes that are, um, you know, that tend, the investors tend to seek are quality, low volatility and income. Right. And so, you know, what if particularly the quality and the low volatility points are really strongly correlated with an ESG type lens, right? So the better, bigger companies that are more able to manage their ESG footprint, they are likely to build up lower volatility. They're likely to have an income stream. Right. And so, you know, that that would be where you would be would be looking towards, I think, a more safe environment. And that is, you know, that is what we've seen in 2022, the sort of very um, exclusionary focused, very kind of thematic, say on, say on renewables, just haven't done that well, right? If you are really restricted in a very thematic environment and in an environment where you're looking for safety, those kind of higher risk assets, assets won't, won't do that well. But, you know, I think in a broader allocation perspective as a client, as an individual investor, you would just want to understand those trade-offs and look to the longer term, right? You're not investing for one year. You're not investing for two years. You're typically investing with, you know, a 10, 20 year horizon. And I think as long as you have kind of a, a mix, right? A mix of options in a, in a portfolio construct, you, are, you can weather the storm. Yeah, yeah. No, very well put. Um, and it also kind of really brings out the, the, the theme that it's really hard for an investor to, to look, because as, as you described, it's a very broad world and there's, there's, there, there are thousands of options out there and options are varying quality. There's been, there's been people who's just been trying to stick because it's been so successful, but not stick ESG badges on things that really shouldn't, you know? Mm -hmm. but, um, and how, as, as an investor, should I be looking at what should I look for if I if I want to kind of put put my money into a fund and you know obviously you don't, you don't be talking about your own firm but just in general terms. Mm. Well, I think it starts with you, right? What are your investment value? What are your values? Full stop. Right? What do you actually care about? Mm. Oh, sorry, no, I, I, I know I know what I care about. And I know what I want to support, but. Um, I know that along uh, uh, in the world out there, there are some 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 people who are more genuine about 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 ESG than others. I have a certain level of knowledge in this stuff, mm. um, but a lot of people who would be, be be looking at it wouldn't. So they wouldn't exactly. be. So they, they wouldn't wouldn't be kind of making the making the the judgments on whether uh, being underweight um, in a oil major is actually an ESG play or not, which. A lot of ESG funds do have oil majors in there, but it's just it's, it, it is less than the market, so therefore it's 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 ESG, it's, it should, it's ESG compliant. Well, that to me, you know, is not. But I understand that, and I can make that decision myself in I, the world. I go back to mm. exactly your point. Mm. You as an individual, you will have a different view of what ESG and what your values are to, to someone else, right? Someone else may say, well, I think it's okay to invest in oil and gas, but I just generally want them to treat their employees right. I want companies to treat, treat their employees right. So actually, that's what I care about. And so it's really important, I think, that actually whoever is investing is clear about 
what they actually want to try and invest in. That's the first point, because unless that's clear, then the options that are on may or may not match, right? Because because actually you have, you know, in that construct of screen, responsible, sustainable, or impact, to your point, you know, there'll be different constructs even within that. And there may be some that completely exclude fossil fuels, but there may be some, to your point, that don't, right? And so you as an individual need to be clear about what you actually believe credible is and what meets your values, right? And that is really important. And I think that's that's what's been missed in all of this is actually that ESG label may be appropriate because there is an ESG construct, but it may not meet the values of, you know, what you think is ESG and therefore, or a pressure group thinks is ESG and therefore funds have been called out for greenwashing. But if they're doing what it says Mm -hmm. they're doing, but it just doesn't match your values, then then that's, that's more about a mismatch of you know, option with investor values as opposed to actual it not doing what it says on the tin. Do you see? It? So yeah, that it is, I yeah. think, that has been one of the key issues in the market, and that's been, I, I think, um, one of the big issues that regulators have had as well. And that's why transparency is super important, right? It's very important that individual investors can see, oh, it excludes these three things. Oh, but it still includes oil and gas. Oh, right, then it's not for me. Right? That's that's what's super important here is transparency. Everybody looks at ESG or will we'll have kind of certain certain lenses, but those particular lenses will uh, vary by um, by your own cultural background, by your own geography, by by you know where where where, where you come from, what you believe. Uh, what we believe in London would be quite different. What you believe in Dubai would be quite different in New York and Hong Kong. Um, but as a global investment fund, like you're trying to to have ESG policies that 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 are for the globe. Hmm. How on earth do you manage that? Yeah. <laughs> What we do is we're really investment led on the financial material integration. And that's where I was talking about, you know, we provide the advice, we provide, we do have a global ESG standard, but it's in the context of what we believe is financial material, right? So the ESG rating is with that kind of link to the bottom line lens on it. And that's what our investment teams use. And that's what we call ESG process integration. Then on top of that, we're client led. And so we produce in different regions, different options for different clients that have different needs, right? And so in Europe, we have probably our biggest ESG product suite, and I'd say most global firms are like that in Europe because the European client base is more interested than, you know, other areas. And so what we are, uh, what we find is as long as the core investment process thinks about ESG from a sustainable value creation perspective, right? Then we can optimize and provide client solutions on top of that, that address all those different values and needs. And that's, I think, that has been really quite successful in terms of making that kind of balanced approach globally, because you're right, it's not the same. It's not the same what people want in Europe or what they want in Asia or what they want in the US. And I think we need to be sensitive to that and deliver what our clients want. Okay, perfect. And getting back to kind of the more um, personal stuff again. <laughs> um, was really interested to see uh, you speaking on the um, um, uh, Financial Times panel on uh, nature positive uh, investment. Um, what does nature positive investment mean to you? Well, nature positive as a concept was actually coined by the World Business Council for Sustainable Development as a, as a topic. It's similar to net zero from a climate perspective, but nature positive means that, that you would have a positive nature result by 2030, and you would actually have um, no net uh, destruction by 2050. So it's, you know, that is what it means. Now, what is interesting is it didn't, that concept didn't actually make it into COP15. And it didn't because it is quite a, it was quite targeted, right? Quite short timelines, 2030. And while COP15, which is the, the, the big biodiversity conference that happened in Montreal in December, uh, was, was really quite, I think, although, successful. Otherwise known as the successful COP of last year. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I think it's, it, it was successful in that it was, it was setting out some broad vision, so some, some broad goals to 2050, 
which were around financing, were around protecting the ecosystem, and actually, I think importantly, halting destruction of ecosystems, which is, you know, probably the single biggest issue we have to face right now. Um, but then it also sets some more specific targets to 2030. And so in some ways, you know, the, the nature positive concept was reflected but it wasn't specifically called out as a, as a as a topic, and so you know that's a, that's an area for debate. You know, maybe it'll come later. Um, but what was very positive about where we are, I think, on biodiversity is, you know, one, it has become a mainstream issue. You know, one of the areas that you know one of the twenty thirty targets were around actually disclosure and reporting, and it included it called out financial institutions explicitly, and so this is now you know, something that not just, you know, the EU regulator has called out, but actually, you know, the world's governments have called out as a topic for the business world to be reporting on and thinking about. And, and you know, you measure, you manage what you measure, right? Yeah, so. yeah. You know, that's, that's great. So you, from a kind of investment management point of view, you're, you sound like you're confident that um, the almost totalitarian obsession with one molecule that is carbon um, will be lessened and biodiversity it will be will be another another element to the, this whole whole debate. I personally I don't think it's it's particularly healthy that we've just been focusing on carbon. I know we we've been so obsessed with carbon. Carbon is really important. Of course it's really important, but there's other important things as well, like biodiversity. It's so it sounds like you're 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 feeling positive that biodiversity might become a more integrated part of that whole conversation. I would I would agree. I mean, I think even COP15 called out climate as well, and COP27 called out biodiversity. So yeah. they are becoming more and more linked, I would say. And I think where we can find solutions, like say in, in carbon capture, that also are net positive for biodiversity outcomes, fantastic. Right, and you are seeing more and more. I think of those kind of solutions, um, and so yes, I think they are. Um, you know, they are linked. But I also agree. You know, biodiversity definitely is is one of the emerging topics that are. Um, you know, everyone's paying much closer attention to. What are the other topics that, of course, with the ESG, very broad, but if, if biodiversity is one of them, what else is, is, are you finding is coming out? Yeah, so the big topic is human rights. So it is a big topic. It is a topic, to your point, that is, that is not universally agreed upon. Um, and what we are trying to do right now and what we've actually done in our, just in our research framework, so in, in, in our um, proprietary rating system, we have included some new data to start scoring companies on human rights. But even just on social issues more broadly, the World um, Benchmarking Alliance that has scored around 1,000 global companies on a 20-point framework, and the average score on social disclosure and management was five. So we have a huge, you know, very long way to go um, in terms of where we are on the social topic within, you know, I think both from a disclosure standpoint, but also actually from a management standpoint in, in uh, companies globally. Yeah. Yeah, I guess it's easy, uh, relatively easier to be uh, calculating your carbon footprint. Like that's, uh, that's binary. Like, you know, you know, as long as you can, you can see where your carbon's being emitted from, you can count it. It's much more in the eye of the beholder of uh, you know, the, the more human rights type type issues. So, how do you assess? How do you manage? How do you how do you put a number on a rating on somebody's position in relation to a less scientifically tangible right? Yeah. Well, and that's we use. So we use third parties, and so this is we brought in a new score um, called the Children Rights Benchmark, mm -hmm. and it's actually um, so we haven't done it for every sector because we again we have a materiality led approach, and so for certain sectors we believe these issues are, are more material than others. Um, but we brought it in. Um, they score around three thousand companies globally, and they score them around uh, policies and management on. Um, you know, really, it's it's a lens of children's rights, but it's brought you know it's really human rights um, issues, and so we brought in that in as a as a topic into our rating system as, as one data, really as a flag 
So the way, it's, it's really just to say, oh, is there something we need to dig into here if they get a really poor score? Um, that's, that's our starting point. So it's, it's really just uh, starting to try and find the data sources from unique places because it's not, you know, it's not a readily available topic that we can just take from a, you know, from, from a third party, you know, you're one of your big third party providers. It's, it's really more of a niche topic. So we're trying to find those kind of data sets that we can bring into our system. And then we are using that more as a flag and a topic for discussion. Um, I think it's a little too immature to have really hard lines on on it uh, right now because I just think it's still a, it's still a very evolving topic mm. for companies and investors to think about. Mm, interesting. Um, I don't, back in my time in in banking, what you'd normally do is um, each team would have like it'd have a lawyer, it'd have an accountant, it'd have it'd have someone who's who's an investment analyst, who's someone who, th who thinks that way. Um, is there like the way that the let's say would the U.S. Equities team, would there be? I'm sure there's 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 there'd be a lawyer and accountant. Would there be someone who's um, an ESG specialist on the team as well, or would they look for you as a kind of as, as basically as an external resource, or is is there an internal person who then also talks to you? How, how does how does that work? So that varies actually from team to team. So in Moscow we have you know all asset classes. So we've got um, you know passive, active, fixed income, uh, real estate, uh, wider private markets. You know we really got uh, all the asset classes. And so investments integration varies between those different asset classes. And also some of them have you know more product ranges in terms of ESG. And so some of our teams will have ESG experts sitting within them. Some of them won't. Um, but for regardless of whether they do or not, the global ESG team really serves as a partner. As a very, we're part of the global investment function. Um, so we are a very close partner to uh, all the investment teams globally. Um, but what we, what we do expect our investors is to, to, to consider ESG. So they are themselves, you know, we sort of... Um, I think the global ESG team is a function to help people help themselves. So it's really a lot of training. We are the a, a team of deep experts. You know, my team has over 13 years average experience in ESG. You know, deep expertise in ESG. Um, you know, certificates and and backgrounds similar to myself. You know, in climate or social issues, um, and so we are really the experts. But we expect everyone, and we're trying to train, you know, provide expertise to, to get everyone up up the learning curve on this topic. Okay. And has the team grown over over over? I'm sure it must have grown massively since you turned up, <laughs> like over the last uh, what four or five years. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Well, um, mm -hmm. so we are now a team of 31 people, mm -hmm. and it has grown substantially. Yes, it's it's more than doubled in size in the last um, three years. So on the um, kind of, kind of focusing in on the the global part of part of, part of your job title, um, where do you see the kind of, the most exciting opportunities for kind of ESG investments um, in, in the world today, outside of the developed world? Like you know, Europe's massively overweight and you know been over over, over analyzed or whatever else. Where do you see is is is, is the the most exciting opportunities. Mm. Gosh, there's so many. I mean, I think, you know, the biggest thing, and I do want to get this, this in because I think it's so exciting for me as an ESG professional that's been in the space, you know, but like you say before, it was, before it was fashionable. Um, but I do want to get this topic in that, you know, I think it's first they ignore you, then they fight you, and then you win, right? And I think we are winning, right? I genuinely believe we're winning. So I am so excited about how ESG is just becoming part of, you know, the standard way of operating. Um, and so that's what I'm most excited about, actually, the sort of that system systemic change. Um, but in terms of the specific product areas, I guess, you know, impact, impact investing and where you are putting, you know, a very tangible, very additional flow of capital and measurable flow of capital is is something I think, you know, frankly, people are are challenging. It's challenging. It's it, that is more right now. That is it's a very niche part of the market. It is largely private markets. And I think you are seeing more interest in 
how do you really make that even more tangible in, say, a, um, you know, fixed income is probably the area where you have new structures, so solution, you know, f- bonds where you can ring fence assets in, in a different way to equities, but then there are new types like blockchain that allows you to break down an equity. So there are those types of innovations that I think you can, if you can link that with impact, those kind of new financial structures with impact, that's, that is super exciting. Um, something that, you know, it'll probably take many years still, but it, it's definitely something that is being looked at. Um, and so, you know, that would be that would be where I think, you know, there is some really exciting areas for, for development and innovation. And another really, really kind of interesting part of, um, so we're kind of going back to one of the original the- themes that you talked about, um, a part of the, your, your kind of your global role is um, engagement. But again, you've got the issue of um, cultural differences and how you 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 treat how how different companies in different in different parts of the world might be more more or less receptive. Well, I think so. My role, I think, is yes, it's some it is to promote ESG, but it's it's probably more to serve our client needs who are interested and are growing interest in, in ESG. And then from a you know from a investment process perspective, again, you know, linking it to a fiduciary perspective and saying actually this is part of a fiduciary responsibility because the companies are being increasingly impacted, right? The companies we invest in are being impacted by these changes. I mean, employees having greater, you know, demands on these type of social equity issues, you know, the environment is changing. I mean, look at the physical risk. I mean, the physical risk from climate change, biodiversity, you know, becoming an increasing impact on supply chains, um, you know, integrity of products, etc. And, you know, the governance of companies, obviously, is a topic that has for, for a very long time been recognized as a as something that will impact bottom line. So I think there is, um, you know, that's my main role is to, to do, you know, to look at companies from that perspective and help educate on that. Um, so in a, in a, you know, a landscape where you do have divergent opinions on, you know, the role of, of um, companies just in that environment, I would just always bring it back to that. It's good for business. And that is what investors are focused on too. It's sustainable value creation. ESG, unfortunately, over over the last, um, well, particularly recent days, um, has become a bit of a a political football. You know, uh, you've had um, Texas taking some pretty, you know, dramatic action uh, against a couple, couple of your peers, BlackRock, Credit Suisse, and others, um, because of their environmental stances and, and, and banning them from from Texan um, state investment. How do you deal with political risk on a like from ESG? Hmm. Well, I'd go back to that same issue. I mean, we are investment led and client led, and so we are looking at what our investment teams think are important to their investment process now financial material ESG issues are important to the investment process. And so that's, you know, that's that's the investment team kind of belief. And and that's how, you know, obviously for the different investment teams, it may manifest itself slightly differently. And that's important, right? That it really is up to the investment teams to incorporate as they see fit for their client base and for, you know, their um, fiduciary duty and maximizing, you know, their objectives, right? Which is for the most part financial return. But then there is also, as I said, clients, right? And our our uh, role is to serve the clients, and it is a broad range of clients. So we may have clients that really care about ESG, we may have clients that don't, and that's you know honestly that's fine. I think that's the nature of the world, and so I think we that's how we are tackling this political issue. It's really politics stays with the politicians, right? We are focusing on what our investors want and what our clients want. Do you see a role for yourself in uh, potentially educating clients in ESG, particularly in areas where there might be um, an associated kind of political risk of of going one one track rather than the other? I think we do have a role to be transparent about what ESG is. And I think there is a lot of confusion, as we have um, highlighted, you know, right from the beginning. 
And so, yes, I do think we are trying to be more transparent about uh, what ESG is and what it isn't. So, for example, in our global stewardship report, which we produce every year, we actually put that right up front. How do we define ESG, right? What are the steps we are taking? How do, how do the different categories work? And we were very transparent about that. And that's been, that's been a very useful um, tool to, to use for, you know, that's a public document, you know, it's on our website. Uh, it's, and it's, it's a useful tool tool for discussion with clients, but also with stakeholders, for sure. I see in kind of the, the ESG investment world in general, um, things that, that appear to be conflicts, where a particular um, fund management firm would, in one set of circumstances, vote one way, and in a very similar set of circumstances, votes in the opposite. Mm -hmm. I'm kind of thinking along the lines of Paris commitments, where kind of a, a, an oil major might be have have one set of set of set of kind of investors saying yes, you should be signing the Paris commitments, and then the same firm on the other side side of the side of the coin, looking at a slight, at a different firm, a different oil major, would vote the opposite way. So I'm just kind of puzzled. How how does that happen? Mm. Is it just because kind of the, the individual fund manager takes their own views? So so you or your 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 peers across the industry would advise and say, well, ESG suggests you should do this, but ultimately it's down to them and what they what they think is appropriate. So we have a global proxy voting policy, and and so there are different approaches just in terms of the industry approach. There isn't actually one industry approach to proxy voting. It is it does differ between the different uh, uh, firms. But uh, what what is generally in place is a proxy voting policy. So in general, uh, the industry you know firms would have a public document that would say this is the proxy voting policy. This is generally our principles of how we vote. Um, and then in terms of how that thing gets applied, it does differ a little bit. So at, at Invesco, we do allow different fund managers to vote differently depending on their you know, beliefs and, and how they feel that fits with their um, strategy. Other firms won't. They will vote one way. So, so they're, they're, those are two different, um, you know, ways of ways of thinking about it. I will say there is a big, um, you know, movement I think in the market to allow actually clients more, more say. So clients and pension funds and so on. Actually, in, in the UK, even there's something called expression of wish, where um, again there's there's a sort of discussion about should should an individual should a should a pension fund have more say in how they actually vote on their their fund. And so you have seen actually more players moving towards, more industry players moving towards that that kind of more optionality around having different votes, right? Which is which has always been our approach in that we we have allowed different funds to make different voting decisions based on you know what their needs are within a global policy construct. So we do have a global policy general guidelines but then individual fund manager makes a decision. Mm. So why that happens is a you know, specific issue, like say a Paris Agreement type shareholder resolution, why you would vote in favor on one company and against in another company tends actually be, to be rather than fund specific, company specific. So probably these, these resolutions will be analyzed by an individual, by an analyst, and they will say, well, this company has already addressed, already has this, you know, strategy already has targets. They don't, they don't need, we don't need to support that. But another company may not, right? And therefore you would be supporting that. So it, it really is quite company specific as to why you vote a certain way, even though the actual resolution in, it, in and of itself looks the same. Okay, no, no that's, that's very clear, thank you. And um, one of the trickier subjects um, across the whole kind of ESG fund management um, industry over well, geez, for a decade, really, um, has been the whole idea of, of divestment. Where is it the right thing to do to 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 take all of your capital out of fossil fuel companies, um, and therefore hardening up an investor base of of people who are you know dedicated to fossil fuels and having have the company have and having no voice then to be able able to talk. Um, 
or not? Because you know you can you can see the argument both sides. You can see the argument to say, well, you know, it's actually the right thing. We don't want to be supporting these companies with our capital, so so move it out. Or you can see the argument the other side said, but we need to be talking to them and trying try and trying to to get them to to you know decarbonize. So how how do you see that dilemma? Mm. Mm. So I think you need both. I do think you need to um, have some hard you know hard backs up hard lines where you know particularly for if the values right if your values are declined as well i just i just don't i just don't want to invest in that sector i just don't want to invest in those types of activities i mean then that's a very clear cut situation i think where it becomes a little less clear is where your entire objective is financial performance and then then i think it's very difficult to say well i'm going to exclude a whole sector or i'm going to exclude you know a whole industry then surely you're better off engaging and having a conversation and saying right so so i need to invest in the market right and the market includes the sector how can i actually improve and how can i be helpful to that conversation right and 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 you know all in the context of of i think in an investment context the fiduciary duty to to maximize returns for the client that yeah. that who is expecting that the other kind of mega trend in the investment industry aside from ESG has been um kind of passive investment and it's always been something that's been a slight slightly kind of puzzling to me is because ESG is aside from carbon as we discussed before um in the eye of the beholder and there has to be some sort of discretion about what's 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 the ESG and what isn't so personally i've struggled with the idea of a passive ESG fund mm. Mm. well so if we start with what is passive investing right because that's that's a thing a passive versus active so in passive you're following an index right and so the way an ESG index works is you set rules and so those rules will be based off different types of data and they'll be t- based off different types of ESG philosophy and so an ESG ETF is basically you know running off the different rules that's basically what it does so i think it's entirely possible to do that because you can have right to your point the measurable bits are yeah. things like carbon you can measure a curb you know company's carbon footprint and you can say this index is only going to be made up of companies that have you know a certain carbon footprint or do better than their peers in the yeah, carbon yeah. footprint i mean that is a measurable thing you can create an index and you can create a solution that follows those kind of companies and then you're investing per definition in those kind of companies and you're not what you're not doing though and that's the active bit is you're making decisions actively right about this company has you know uh, maybe slightly a uh, higher carbon footprint but it's improving you know that wouldn't that would not be allowed in a play. in a passive you have rules and you follow the rules in an active you're more flexible right and you can actually understand what a company is doing and you can you can be you can go with them on a journey and and all of those kind of things and it's you know also i think in a passive you are much more subject to good data and so in a passive construct it is it is more difficult to get to some of those you know items that we mentioned earlier you know those softer elements that probably are more of a conversation with a company right and so those are the two you know differences i think with with passive esg and, and active esg but it's i think it's entirely possible to do you know have an esg etf and actually it's it's the preferred vehicle for many because it it does take a little bit of the subjectivity out right you know the rules it follows the rules and you get you know that you get the rules whereas i guess in an active construct it is more subjective but in an active construct you have more optionality as well you can say well actually this company hasn't done what it was supposed to it's not going to invest in it at all whereas in a passive construct you have to invest in the whole index right like you can't you can't take something out until the index rebalances understand understand okay so as long as you narrowly define it and la- narrowly define it to um items that are reported on regularly with some sort of consistency and some sort of um general understanding so like carbon for instance you know bmg goes in or or out based on carbon then it's possible but it becomes much more difficult if you're trying to do it on um another aspects of of the 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 s and the g particularly 
I would say so. And I think, you know, I think it's really important for people to understand what they are investing in and coming back to the earlier conversation, because I think, you know, in an ESG ETF, what you also have many ESG ETFs run off ESG ratings. So they're not specific to a carbon issue. It's an amalgamation of that ES and G, you know, those ESG topics that we talked about earlier. And then it comes up with a rating and says you are an A rated on E, S, and J, or B rated on E, S, and J. And that means you are following whatever that rating provider has decided is important within E, S, and J. So, so I think it's important for people who are investing in ESG ETFs to understand that rating system, because actually in the ESG world, one rating system can be 50% different to another rating. There is zero correlation. So actually you could get really very different outcomes Wow. based on what rating system you're oh, running wow. your rules off. Okay, wow. So that's, so that's kind of a new world for me. Is it, is it, it's, like, it's kind of the Moody's and Standard & Poor's for ESG. Is it, this, is it those same companies or is it? There, are, there is loads and loads of providers out there. Mm -hmm. Moody's do have a rating. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Stan Ports have a rating, uh, MSCI have a rating, there's Sustainalytics, there, there's a whole bunch of ISS have a rate. There are lots and lots of rating yeah. providers out there. But the, in a kind of debt um, type of world, they tend to be within... They're very highly the, correlated yeah, very in the debt world. Mm. In the ESG world, there is zero correlation, pretty much zero. Wow. And that's why, yeah, that's... That's a key challenge because that means exactly you are not comparing apples with apples if you have a different ESG rating system. Um, so investment is kind of, is crystal ball you know, gazing stuff. It's trying to trying to get a, a good uh, sense of the future and trying to make your uh, make your decisions on well, what you, what you feel the, the future will will hold. Um, if if I were making investments today on with an ESG hat on, what advice would you give me? To, what what things do I need to kind of to look for for the sustainable and the the, the sensible investment of tomorrow? Mm. What advice would I, give? I would say the first thing is make your money matter, right? So think about what you are, what you care about, whether the disclosures on whatever product you're looking at matches those values. And that's how I would just be really critical about uh, what you're investing in. That would be my, that would be yeah, my yeah, biggest piece, piece of advice. advice. Fantastic piece of advice. Great. Well, thank you again so much for your time. It's been great, great, great conversation. Really enjoyed it and learned an awful lot. Uh, so thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very and, much. Okay. Appreciate it. it. Well, thank you very much for uh, joining us on that conversation. Uh, we hope that you enjoyed it. Uh, we hope that you uh, learned something. Uh, if you did enjoy it, please feel free to leave a five-star review and uh, to subscribe to, uh, to any of our channels. And uh, we'll be sure to keep you updated on future productions. This series is produced by United Renewables in collaboration with the London Business School Alumni Energy Club.